Video 3 in Justin Peters' series of videos called A Call for Discernment is entitled The Hurt of Healing. In the first clip, Benny Hinn says the preaching of the gospel without signs and wonders is an empty shell. If the preaching of the gospel lacks signs and wonders, it's an empty shell. If the preaching of the gospel lacks signs and wonders, it's an empty shell. Friends, that is heresy. What does the Apostle Paul say? Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is the power of God? The gospel is, as it is read and as it is preached from God's Word. Well, Paul also said his preaching was with the demonstration of the Spirit and power, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Jesus said signs would follow believers, Mark 16, 17. In Acts 1, 8, he said we would receive power to be witnesses. And the Greek word for witnesses, martyrs, means people who provide evidence. Mark said the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs, Mark 16, 20. In Lystra, Paul preached the gospel, and a man who had never walked was suddenly healed. Acts chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. So, I would say that, essentially, Benny Hinn is correct. The preaching of the gospel is supposed to be done with the power of the Holy Spirit accompanying it to provide evidence to confirm the word. Again, I remind you that Benny Hinn isn't word of faith. However, in this case, I would agree with him. In the next clip, J.P. says that 3 John 2 is just a normal greeting and it isn't teaching us anything about financial prosperity and physical healing. It is possible to over-spiritualize parts of the Bible. Okay, it's, it's possible to over-spiritualize parts of the Bible. And to take, take 3 John 2 as a blanket promise for guaranteed healing and guaranteed wealth is over-spiritualizing this verse. Basically, John is writing a letter to his friend Gaius. And John opens his letter in much the same way that you and I might open a letter that we write to one of our friends today. Basically, John's saying this, Dear Gaius, I hope that this finds you doing well. Friends, that's all in the world he's saying. This is just a common greeting to a letter. This is not a statement of theology. This is not a doctrinal statement. It's just a greeting to a letter. Well, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine. That would include greetings. I've heard lots of expository preaching done on greetings in epistles. James's greeting says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. James was the brother of Jesus, and yet he didn't pull rank and identify himself that way. He found his identity in serving Jesus. Well, that's good teaching there, and it's teaching from a greeting in an epistle. Besides, 3 John 2 isn't the only verse used in the teaching that God wills our prosperity. The Old Covenant said that Israel would be blessed if they kept the words of the law. Job was blessed. Abraham was blessed. Solomon was blessed. The book of Proverbs is replete with admonition to seek wisdom, which will bring riches and long life. Proverbs 8:18. 8, 3 John 2 is just confirming what the rest of the scripture has established regarding both financial and physical prosperity. Next, JP tells us that Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 is spiritual healing. Verse 5, Isaiah continues and says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Very clearly the context of Isaiah 53 is not physical healing, it's spiritual healing. Well, Matthew 8, 16 and 17 says otherwise. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So according to Matthew, 
The context of Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 is physical healing. Oddly enough, JP confirms this in the next clip. There is one New Testament writer that appeals to Isaiah 53 apparently in the context of physical healing. Matthew does so in Matthew chapter 8 when he records Jesus' healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And Matthew says that it was done in order that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, He himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. Actually, his mother-in-law was healed earlier in the day. In the evening, he healed all who were sick. That's when Matthew quoted Isaiah 53. Uh, what are we to do with this? Oh, gee, I don't know. Believe it? Accept it? Claim it? Act on it? Just thought. Not all the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Some of the benefits of Jesus' atonement are not promised to be realized until the other side of heaven. And healing from sickness and disease is one of those benefits. Well, here's the problem with your reasoning, JP. Matthew didn't say when we all get to heaven, we'll all be healed in fulfillment of Isaiah 53. He said that the sick people who were brought to Jesus 2,000 years ago were healed in fulfillment of Isaiah 53. You see, some people will just bend over backwards and go through all kinds of theological contortions in an effort to avoid what the Bible clearly says. If they would put as much effort into believing it, acting on it, and getting it to work for them as they do running away from it and attacking people who believe it, they might get results. Next, Justin Peters tells us that Job is a problem for the word of faith. Job. Job is the theological elephant sitting in the living room of the faith preachers, <laughs> none of whom want to admit is there. Job's a problem for the prosperity gospel because here you have a man who was upright and righteous, hadn't done anything wrong, and yet God still allowed Satan to come and strike from Job everything that he had. His family, his possessions, and ultimately his own health. Job's a problem for the faith preachers. It's not a problem for me. Let's talk about Job. God blessed Job. The man had seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and an unspecified number of servants. After his ordeal ended, the Bible says that God gave him twice as much as he had before. The whole story of Job took place in one year, so that means that 209 of his 210 years, he was blessed, which is more than 99.5% of his life. I'd take that, wouldn't you? Next, JP tells us about Paul's thorn in the flesh. For this reason, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this thorn, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. The Apostle Paul had some kind of thorn in the flesh. Um, what was that thorn? We don't know. Scholars have been debating about the identity of this thorn for centuries. In fact, the matter is, we just don't know what it was. Well, actually, we do know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. It was a messenger of Satan, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. The word for messenger in the Greek is angelos, which is where we get the word angel. So it was an angel of Satan sent to buffet him. And then in verse 9, Paul describes what the angel of Satan was up to, causing weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. Not a word about sickness. Flip over to Galatians chapter 4. When Paul writes, But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. The Greek word for illness in the New American Standard is asthenian which can mean illness, condition, or weakness. I believe the infirmity could have been the result of a stoning he experienced in Acts 14 at Lystra. After God raised him up, he went back into the city and then traveled to Derby the next day. When you're the victim of a stoning, the people aim for your head, 
which would certainly leave you repulsive to look at if you survived, as Paul did. Maybe the people at Lystra couldn't bear to look at him, so he went on to preach at Derby. It would also explain why the Galatians would have been willing to pluck out their eyes for Paul, Galatians 4.15. It's just a theory, but it makes sense to me. I can't prove that Paul wasn't sick. It's hard to prove a negative. After all, I can't prove that Santa Claus doesn't exist. But at the same time, the Word of Faith opponents can't prove that Paul was sick. The reason the faith preachers don't go to the hospitals is because they can't control the atmosphere in the hospitals. I've prayed for people in hospitals, and I've seen miracles occur. In the Assembly of God Church I attended back in the 70s, the pastor's wife prayed for Sister Porter, who was in the hospital dying from cancer, and Sister Porter was healed and started attending church again. When I left that church two years later, she was still there. Next, Justin Peter says that E.W. Kenyon died from a tumor and Kenneth Hagin died from heart disease. Essek W. Kenyon, the grandfather of this movement, died from a tumor. Kenneth Hagin, father of the modern Word of Faith movement, died from heart disease. Joe McIntyre from the Kenyon Gospel Publishing Society addressed the tumor rumor in his book E.W. Kenyon and his message of faith, the true story. Kenyon was never diagnosed with or treated for a tumor. He died at home at the age of 80, and the physician who was called to the home to pronounce him dead wrote tumor on the death certificate because he saw a growth on the back. This was 1948, and they weren't as strict about documentation in those days. As for Kenneth Hagen's death, he died from heart failure at the age of 86, which was nearly 70 years beyond what he was expected to live, having been born with a deformed heart and an incurable blood disease. Like Kenyon, he lived in health and he was at home with his family, and suddenly he was gone. But he kept on working right up until the end. There's nothing about the way that these two men died that contradicts what they taught. In these videos, I've shown that much of Justin Peter's condemnation of the Word of Faith is based on logical fallacies, misinformation, distortions, and religious bigotry. While I would never fault him publicly for merely having views that differ from mine, when he puts numerous videos on YouTube for public consumption that are clearly misleading, somebody has to respond. Trust me, I have better things to do with my time than rebut this stuff. But too many people are being led to believe things that aren't true. People who could benefit from a right understanding of physical healing in the atonement. People who could overcome any number of difficulties in life by learning how faith works and, understand the, and understanding the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. People in ministry who could become more productive for the kingdom of God if they had the power of the Holy Spirit in manifestation in their ministries. The Bible tells us not only to share our faith, but to defend our faith. Paul said that we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10.5. The knowledge of God comes through the knowledge of His Word. So it's important that faulty arguments against what the Word of God says about faith, healing, confession, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit be destroyed. That's why I do what I'm doing and I hope you've benefited from it. Thanks for watching, and be blessed.